Another busy night. A cold one, but we're used to that, right? Here it's uh, it's the heartland. We're a hardy bunch, but probably uh, the number one topic in the uh, halls of the uh, state capitol today was, boy, is it cold out there. Everybody was talking about how, how cold it was. I did bump into Senator Tony Grinberg earlier, and he was uh, going from the Peacock here over to another meeting a block or so away and had no top coat on. I said, seriously, no, no, no coat, Senator? And he said, Pfft. I got one in my car. I'll be fine. So, but other than him, I think everybody else had a coat and, and, and some reinforcements. It's a it's a it's a cold night. But you know what? It's warm inside the Peacock Alley. Another hour of the Legislature Today Radio Show. Hi, everybody. I am Scott Hannon. Dale Wetzel, the managing editor of Great Plains Examiner, which, by the way, the new uh, February edition of the Great Plains Examiner will be hitting newsstands Saturday, so look forward to Saturday. A lot of folks saying, when's it coming, when's it coming? It has a new capital report in it, which will be a product that will be uh, covering uh, regular, even more so than the monthly, the North Dakota legislative session, so uh, look for that as well. And we are coming to you from the Peacock Alley, American Grill and Bar. If you're in and around Bismarck Mandan, join us Monday through Thursday nights here at the Peacock, 422 East Main Avenue, in the historic Patterson Building, where... The legislature actually met once, a few times, actually, over the years. Lots of history here. It's political wing night, right wings and left wings. Ten fresh chicken wings are only five bucks, and I know your mouth is uh, is uh, drooling. Uh, Dale, I apologize for that since you have to tell us what happened at the legislature today before we have our GNDC roundtable here. That's true. You're you're jacking me around with chicken wings here before I have to talk. <laughs> Throwing you off your game a little bit, right? Oh, no, not really. No, um, okay, good. You have to do better than chicken wings. Nothing could do that. Nothing yeah. can throw Del Wetzel off his game. Anyway, uh, the, the Thursdays and Fridays in the legislature are, are what are called uh, two-day two committee two day committee days. And uh, the what that means is you have, the legislature has committees that meet three days a week and then committees that meet two days a week. And then there's the budget committees which meet five days a week. Uh, the significance of this is, is the two-day committees generally handle fewer bills. And so there are fewer bills to deal with uh, in a general sense. But one of the exceptions is the natural resources committees in the uh, Senate and House. They deal with energy uh, bills. They also deal with hunting and fishing, which is always a popular subject in the, in the legislature in North Dakota. And the House Natural Resources Committee today uh, heard uh, details on a number of bills that deal with oil uh, deal with landowner rights in western North Dakota. One of them would establish a new oil and gas wall plugging and site reclamation fund with a $75 million cap, which would be financed uh, by oil taxes. Another one would require the mediation of disputes between surface and mineral rights owners using a mediation office that is part of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, others are intended to uh, promote uh, oil company readiness to actually drill a rig uh, close to the expiration date of their lease. There's uh, reports about, you know, uh, oil companies essentially taking very minimal steps to to be able to uh, drill for oil within the uh, term of their lease. You know, you stick a you know piece of pipe in the ground or something like that, and 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 you do that as a method of preserving your lease. Uh, what this bill is intended to do is to make it so that an oil company must be ready to go, basically, before the, uh, ready to go meaning ready to drill a well before the uh, lease expires. Uh, one of the more important bills uh, would deal with, um, would require the installation of flow meters and pressure cutoff switches on gas and liquid transmission lines uh, that aren't regulated by the Public Service Commission. Uh, this would ho hopefully help to speed the detection of breaks in such things as saltwater disposal lines, because if a saltwater disposal line breaks, it can cause a real uh, pollution problem in a hurry. Uh, one other bill talked about the minimum distance of, of a oil well from uh, a home. Right now, you can, only, you can drill an oil well 500 feet from an occupied home. Uh, this would extend, the bill would extend that distance to a quarter mile, which is uh, 1,320 feet. It's good math on your part. Just to just to get um, off the subject of uh, oil uh, landowner rights, uh, there's a bill in the House Political Subdivisions that says local governments may not regulate political signs or on private property 90 days before any election and 30 days after any election, although signs may be limited to 40 square feet in residential areas. That sounds like a like a hunk and big sign, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, in House Transportation, there's a bill that would require the Department of Transportation to cooperate with the Department of Homeland Security in coming up with an enhanced driver's license 
which would meet the federal standards for getting you into the country. As, as I understand it, it would be similar to the passport card that you could now get from the U.S. State Department for the, the low, low price of, I believe it's $45. Uh, this one would cost you $15, and it, its purpose would be to, uh, if you're, I imagine in North Dakota, the, the purpose would be, if you're in Canada and you want to get back into the country, this specialized license or enhanced license would be able to get you back into the United States, and you'd only have to pay $15 extra to get it. Um, this to, this has to the last thing I'm going to mention. We're going to be speaking about with our with our guests this evening. Uh, the uh, there's a, a political debate that's uh, gaining a lot of steam about a proposal by the majority Republicans in the legislature to cut oil taxes. Uh, what would happen here is that the top oil tax rate in North Dakota would dro would drop from 11.5 percent to 9.5 percent beginning in January of 2017. There would also be some changes. It increased some taxes too, right? Yeah, that, I'm getting to that, Scott. There would also be some changes uh, on what are called stripper wells. Uh, stripper wells right now pay a lower rate of tax, but the stripper wells, the, the way the stripper well uh, law is worded, way, the way it's structured, some wells that are actually high-producing wells uh, are qualifying for stripper well tax treatment. This bill would get rid of that uh, element of uh, North Dakota oil taxation, which would mean that uh, certain stripper wells that are certain wells that are now considered strippers, even though they are should not be stripper wells, uh, would be taxed at a higher rate. Uh, the Democrats in the legislature don't like this idea because they say that it essentially amounts to a mammoth tax break for the oil industry. Uh, in the in the future, they estimate that uh, from 2017, which is when the lower tax rate takes effect, uh, to 2021, uh, that the state treasury would forego approximately 600 million dollars in those five years alone. Uh, what they're in order to uh, come up with this assumption, they're using a Department of Mineral Resources projections on the number of new wells that are going to be drilled uh, during that period of time and. Uh, they're assuming an $80 uh, per barrel uh, price of oil, and these are all uh, projections that are in line with uh, what the state budget office and the tax department and the Department of Mineral Resources have uh, put forward. And essentially, this is the big, this is the um, the first bill in the legislature where there's uh, essentially being a partisan line drawn in the sand. Uh, the Democrats are saying, do not cut taxes for oil companies. That's, the industry is doing quite well under the present tax regime. And by cutting the top tax rate, uh, North Dakotans are going to be foregoing a lot of money. And therefore, it is not justified. Well, what the counter argument to this is, is that uh, North Dakota's uh, top tax rate is fairly high when compared to other states. And that capital uh, that invests in the oil industry is quite mobile and can go elsewhere if North Dakota's tax climate is not competitive. And the Democratic response to that basically is, okay, when that happens, we'll deal with it then. It's not happening now, therefore we don't need to deal with it now. And so this will be an interesting uh, situation. I mean, a similar bill came up two years ago, but it was late in the session. It really didn't get any traction. Now there's plenty of time during this session to have a full-on uh, full-throated debate about what the tax rate on the oil industry should be and uh, a, what, what appropriate tax policy uh, is uh, in western North Dakota when it comes to uh, taxing uh, rising oil production. All right. Well, we'll include that in our roundtable. Uh, Andy Peterson from the Greater North Dakota Chamber of Commerce, along with one of their top lobbyists, man who's been around the Capitol a lot of years, Bill Shalhoub, Shalhoub is here uh, to talk a little bit about the, these issues and more. And uh, always uh, good to have our friends in from GNDC to sort of handicap what happened in the legislature uh, this week and look ahead a little bit uh, as well. So Dale Wetzel is here, managing editor of the Great Plains Examiner and Great Plains uh, News to talk with our guests about uh, the week that was. Gentlemen, what do you think about this uh, proposal to revamp oil taxes in North Dakota, reduce the top rate, and uh, the arguments uh, pro and con? Yeah. I have to say, Dale, first of all, we have not 
had enough of time to look at this bill to see what it really does and take a real position on it. I, I'm just going to add to your analysis a couple things. Uh, first of all, when we talk about oil, we not only have to talk about the rate, as Scott mentioned, at 11.5%, we have to talk about what the effective tax rate is, and that is the tax rate with all of the exemptions that are there now for new wells, uh, all of the exemptions that exist for stripper wells and all that kind of thing. Uh, North Dakota at one time had a tax rate, effective tax rate, with all the exemptions built in of around 10%, maybe just over. Because of the high productivity in the Bakken wells, that rate today is about 10.8. It's not anywhere near the uh, 10 and a half or the 11 and a half that, that, that's charged. I guess that's near, but at any rate, it is below, the effective rate is below the actual rate. The second thing that's important in this discussion is the distinction of stripper wells versus stripper well properties. And I think under current law that if a well becomes a stripper well and at some point somebody, uh, the company goes in and does puts the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh well on that thing with, with a, from the same well pad, the tax under the current law, uh, the thinking is that the tax will continue at the stripper rate. So, so then that's what they call the, the concept of stripper well properties. And the third element that's entering into this is the uh, present oil cap. If I think it's any, the, ca the price of oil falls below like 52.50 for any consecutive five or six month period, the whole 11, uh, the whole six and a half percent extraction tax goes away until it gets above that number for another whatever that thing is. So the idea, I think, is to redefine stripper wells. The idea is to redefine, uh, to eliminate the, the, the cap on the trigger on the lowest side so the North Dakota would never be without the extraction tax. And, and uh, then to come up with a, a formula, given all those things, that creates a sure and certain revenue stream for North Dakota. I, Bill, I think that you've covered the, uh, the bases on that one pretty well. You know, it kind of reminds me of a debate that they're having over in Minnesota right now. In Minnesota, they're talking about lowering the sales tax but then they're talking about spreading it out. And so at the end of the day there, what happens is is that taxes are raised by $4 billion. They have a $1.1 billion shortfall, and the business community hates it over there because even though it lowers the rate, it, it moves it to everything, and then, of course, it generates more because it's business-to-business -business, uh, sales tax and those kinds of things. So in a way, it's, it's kind of like that uh, dynamic over there, and, and I think Bill's entirely correct. I think you have to look at the details of this thing before you make any analysis. Again, uh, Bill summarized it very nicely, but uh, we've not taken a stand on it yet. Representative Owens, what about the <coughs> the idea that, I mean, do you really have any data that, that suggests that if we have a primary seatbelt law that <coughs> it might be easier to detect uh, drunk and driving? Well, no, I don't, other than what I have heard from uh, law enforcement personnel i don't have any how do i say this uh statistical data necessarily uh there hasn't been any studies that i'm aware of on that but at the same time i'm interested by the uh by the aspect of one life is not good enough to warrant you know saving uh i can't help but remember walking across this bridge in the middle of the day early morning and there was this pickup truck sitting there and a man standing beside the pickup truck and this was on a very long narrow bridge when i was growing up and the uh the gentleman standing beside the pickup truck i noticed that his engine of the pickup truck was in the passenger seat and down the road from him was a station wagon with four people in it but the front end was crushed and what had happened is on that bridge he had slammed into him but he's standing there asking me where his keys are because he needs to get in his truck and go home. He was so drunk he didn't recognize the damage that he had done, and those four people were dead. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize that there's no guarantee that he would have been uh, picked up in this case. All I'm saying is here, day in and day out, I am a very huge opponent of individual liberties, but that liberty for an individual, in my opinion, ends when actions you take can threaten my liberty. And that's the way I feel this poss possible can happen. And if this gives them the opportunity to, as they're s seeing a car approach, and I've talked to a number of them, in this day and age, it's very, very easy to tell if you're wearing a seatbelt in a car. Sure, at night it's a little more difficult, but not on lighted roads in, in town, not during the daytime. It's very easy for them to see it. They've, 
they recognize it many, many times, uh, they being the law enforcement agencies have told me this, and if they pull over that one person and avoid that accident, I personally think it's worth it. And all I'm doing is asking people to come in, testify at the hearing, and I, I, I invite him to come in and testify as well, and we'll let the legislature decide. And, the, and if the people don't want it, we'll hear from them again. Representative Hake, uh, you're one of a, a group of new uh, freshman legislators, and you're also uh, much younger than the average legislator. We have a, a very interesting group of new young freshman legislators in the um, in the capital this year, and that's uh, quite refreshing to see. Do you, what do you think is the attitude amongst your peer group about something like this? Do they view it as an infringement on liberty, or uh, do they do they care about it? You know, I've talked to quite a few of them and from both parties, and I'm getting sort of a mix, but there's probably more support for it among this age group than there would be of people... Um, who are among the average age of legislators. And I think that's because we grew up learning the importance of seatbelts. And we didn't grow up in that era where you debated if we should have seatbelts and then seatbelts are in the car and then do we have to use them. We grew up sort of in that kind of like we grew up with smoking is bad and nobody smokes and none of us do that anymore. So, yeah, I, I would say that there's probably a little bit more support among the younger caucus. We have two Republican senators and a former Democratic state senator uh, with us uh, this evening. We have uh, Senator Robert, excuse me, excuse me, Senator Robert Herbley, a Republican from Lair in South Central North Dakota. We have Senator Terry Wanzik of uh, Jamestown. He is uh, he's uh, with us as well. And then we have Senator Dan, a former Senator Dan Wogsland who is the director of the North Dakota Grain Growers Association, and he is living proof that, yes, Democrats have been in the majority in the North Dakota Senate. And, uh, and it's uh, uh, quite interesting, <laughs> too, because when I see when I deal with Dan, that's, this is the context in which I first think of him. It, I don't think of him in his current job. I think of him as a uh, Democratic uh, Senate leader in the days when uh, the Democrats actually control the Senate. That hasn't happened for some time now. And... Uh, but it does happen, just uh, in case uh, folks are wondering whether it does indeed happen. Senator Wanzik, what type of proposals do you have in the legislature that you'd like uh, to discuss with us this evening? Well, Dale, um, if there's one thing that I've heard a lot of back home over the past four years, it's about infrastructure. Um, of course, uh, the, the oil patch is experiencing a lot of need in that area as well, but <laughs> I felt it was our job or my job to uh, raise the issue of uh, infrastructure needs in our part of the state, in the eastern part. And given the flooding and the wet weather of the past number of years, it's created a lot of havoc on our roads. And when you think of agriculture, uh, I often had urban friends wonder, well, why should we help pay for your roads? When you look at what the agriculture industry means to the economy in North Dakota, and when you consider that in this country, one out of every three acres is exported, and then when you think of North Dakota, it's even more so, one of, of two, and when you take spring wheat and things of that nature, uh, it's vitally important to have this infrastructure to, in a timely manner, get our crops harvested and get them into the marketplace. Uh, it means a lot to North Dakota. Senator Herbley, you, you have uh, some initiatives on scenic highways and recreational access. Could you uh, tell us what those are about, please? Well, yes. Uh, those areas, uh, recreational access, scenic byways and highways, areas going to historical roads, they, uh, uh, sites, they've kind of been uh, put on the back burner in the last couple of years just because of, of, of the great needs in the oil patch and, and also out in agriculture. And, and if I may uh, just in, inject here um, to our previous discussion, um, agriculture still has three times more the dollar impact to the state of North Dakota than, than oil has. So um, that in itself would, is pretty significant. But going back to the, to the scenic uh, road areas, those roads typically were, were funded by the Special Roads Fund. And that fund has really struggled in the last number of years because uh, it was 
they get their money in the special road funds drawing interest from the federal monies, from the Federal Highway Distribution Fund. And as you know, the interest rates are almost non-existent. So that fund hasn't grown enough to, to really uh, make an impact in there. And, and it uh, was limited to 250000 a project, while to where today's costs have gone, $250,000 will build, build you a pretty good approach, you know, when you're looking at probably $3 million a mile to do a road. So... Um, Typically in, in the legislature, bills that, are, that come through that are specific to one district or, or one area, one particular road, those bills don't get a lot of traction because there's always someone saying, well, what about me? So we put together a pool of money uh, this session to address the problem statewide. Senator Miller, aside from the animal the Humane Treatment of Animals bill that your committee is handling. What other uh, pieces of legislation are there that you think are of particular note? Well, uh, I think with things that are happening outside of the Ag Committee are, are very important to agriculture. Taxation, uh, road development, br you know, bridge, all that stuff. That, you know, you got, you got the things happening in oil country, but you got, you remember the the structures and the things that we drive down the road have gotten a lot bigger since those bridges and roads were built 80 years ago. And that's that's the biggest thing that I think is facing agriculture in, in North Dakota today is, is, is are we going to build out the infrastructure? Are we going to uh, continue to, to develop and have a, a long plan for, for bringing our, our state and, and everything around it up to what agriculture needs in the future? And and a lot of things that, that Doug was alluding to, I mean, that's that's what we do here. We don't necessarily come here to, to create new regulations and new laws. We're, we're here to make government work with what agriculture needs and then and then match that with public safety and what the, the overall uh, health of North Dakota is, you know, and try and create a balance there. And like, like the fertilizers, for example, got to make sure that they're what they say they are because you got a you got a economic cost and then you got a, a, a environmental cost if you're putting down something that you say is 80 percent nitrogen but it's a hundred percent nitrogen and you're and you're pouring it on your crop well that, that could be dangerous and just the same with anything uh, you know feeding dogs or, or whatever some tainted feed that, that can that can be very dangerous for a lot of things that's what that's what we do here and that's Doug's uh, department is really good about working with the people and working with the producers and, and, and not trying to penalize somebody for just maybe being unaware of what the situation should be, but, but uh, work them all together. And you got groups like Dan Wogslin here, uh, the grain growers that they're just great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> great wow. resource you tap into them. You know, it's our whole stakeholders out here across the yeah. state. They're, they're a great resource. You need to tap into them. You get some feedback, some information. They're so good at providing that and being candid and honest, even when you don't want them to be. No, that's, <laughs> I'm kidding, Dan. But, you know, it is the, that large egg community exists. With those 46 different commodities that are produced in this state, you have a, a large percentage of those that are represented, but you also have the egg community with the egg organizations that look at general farm issues so you get all of them together, and you really tap that resource to figure out not only what the needs are, what the wants are, what's the concerns, and then you try to define the best way to move forward, understanding that there are federal laws and there's even state laws that we have to adhere to. So let's design this, and let's go out there and do education compliance, which serves the industry better, serves our, our whole ag community better, and serves the public better. To what extent has the re recent... Uh caterwauling over the federal farm bill affected the industry in your gentleman's judgment to a small degree uh, I, I think what it's been is more disappointing than anything else think about a whole egg community that for a year and a half labored over this thing worked with the senate uh, egg committee worked with the house egg committee and then to see that all get tossed away when the administration circumvented both the the senate and the house egg committees went directly to the house undermine them, undercut them, 
and forwarded something uh, such as an extension. Now, keep in mind, the current farm bill that we've been operating under was good. It's just that everybody had their hopes to pass new farm bill without being subjected to cuts in the future that had some real teeth in it it, that would put some disaster and some risk management tools up there for farmers and ranchers and the revenue aspect that was going to work for other farmers that wanted to look at other options. And and what it's done, uh, Dale, it's just created some uncertainty out there. It, and, and that's the problem. Because while they're talking about uh, direct payments being paid, for example, with the extension, the fact is, in all likelihood, those direct payments are going to be gone. So you've got all kinds of ch- uncertainty out there, which just creates uh, a, a lot of problems. You know, we have some uh, risk management tools that are going to be in this uh, Farm Bill, such as margin protection, that, that we're going to need to have the Farm Bill authorization in order to get that going. That's a new crop insurance product that's good for wheat farmers. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that creates a lot of problems, and, and uh, we've got to get this done. So what is the solution here, gentlemen? Well, I think it really comes down to uh, just continuing to work with the House and, and Senate Ag Committees. Hopefully we don't have to start work all over again. I think that is very fearful to the rest of the ag community nationwide. We already had some in place. Let's move forward with it. Let's d- draw a line in the sand and say no more cuts. We've taken a very large disproportional uh, cuts in the last several years. We can't take any more. We gave up a lot in this one. We shouldn't be doing any more with the new proposed bills and don't let them rehash it. And, and Dale, let me tell you something. If These are the policy leaders. You know, Senator Miller, Representative Johnson, Commissioner Goring. These are the policy leaders for North Dakota agriculture. And they do a great job for us. If we had those kind of policy leaders in Washington, D.C., and get the job done like this legislature does and like these policy leaders get done, we would have a whole different, uh, a whole different uh, makeup, and we'd have a whole different country. And that's the problem out there, and we got to get it fixed. Is there a, uh, uh, an appetite uh, to start over on the Farm Bill and the, in the Ag Committees in the Senate and House? Well, I don't think there is so much there within the Senate and the House uh, committees themselves. Uh, There might be a few that are talking about it. I think there's an expectation that uh, because we got to the fiscal cliff or we're going to get to the fiscal cliff and and there's going to have to be deeper cuts made in the federal budget, that they're going to have to retool the farm bill. And I think the reality is we cut a lot out of this one. Why cut cut anymore? It's an issue. I think the ag community is going to say, no, this is it. We've given enough. We aren't even asking for a program that ever looked like anything from the past. It's completely different. It's risk management tools. It is a revenue-based product that helps those when prices tip upside down. But that's it. Um, I think that's, I believe that's where the ag community is at. The problem is we're going to have to communicate that well to Congress. People sitting at, us, people sitting at home they should know that your average Joe farmer, he's not he's not going to worry about. He's going to farmers are going to continue to farm. He's not going to worry about what's going on in Washington. What the only thing he's concerned about is if something new is going to come out of Washington. He knows what the farm bill is now. He likes that you can take some away, you can give me some more. That's fine, but just don't create new regulations that's going to endanger me. We've been speaking this evening too. Uh, the gentleman you just heard, who is uh, Senator Joe Miller, a Republican from Park River. He's the chairman of the North Dakota Senate Agriculture Committee. We've been speaking to Representative Dennis Johnson, a Republican from Devil's Lake. He is the chairman of the North Dakota House Agriculture Committee. We've also been speaking to the grand poobah of agriculture in North Dakota, uh, Doug Goring, who is the North Dakota Agriculture Commissioner, and also the grand poobah of everything, uh, Dan Wogsland, who is the director of the North Dakota Grain Growers Association. Thank you, gentlemen. Great conversation. We thank also the North Dakota Grain Growers Association for sponsoring tonight's hour of the Legislature Today radio show live from the Peacock Alley American Grill and Bar in downtown Bismarck. When in Bismarck, stop and see us for the Legislature Today radio show. We're back Saturday, 10 a.m. to noon right here.